All right, we are live. Welcome, everybody, to the Gunner Technology live stream, a weekly tech talk for non-techies and techies alike. I'm your host, Derry Merkins. With me is CEO of Gunner Technology, Cody Swan. What's up, Cody? Uh, it's another day in paradise. Yeah, how is it down Florida ways these days? Well, I haven't see, actually been outside today since I got back from the gym at like 7 o'clock, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> and my, my windows are shut, so I can't really <laughs> see what's going on out there. So potentially uh, another day in paradise. Potentially yeah, it's potentially. like the apocalypse outside and you just don't know. That's right. That's right. Could be fire and brimstone. Uh, let's dive right into it because we got actually a little bit of a late start because Facebook uh, changed our API key on us without telling us. So we had to fix that live on Periscope. I hope everyone on Periscope enjoyed that little live bug fixing section uh, they're session. Definitely, they're definitely learning something from, on Periscope today. That was good content. Uh, the winner of the uh, Country Shore giveaway, which you can sign up for on our Facebook page, Country Shore Outfitters is a lifestyle brand for anyone who loves the outdoors. Visit them at countryshoreoutfitters.com. The winner is Dan F. from Austin, Texas, down Teja Way. So, Dan, you've got uh, a sweet Country Shore hat and copies of our ebooks heading your way. So enjoy those and uh, enjoy the lovely Austin, Texas fall. That's actually an awesome city. You ever been to Austin, Texas? I have. It is. It's fun. It's a That's a great fun. place. Yeah. That's an awesome, awesome town. Um, so Dan, congratulations on winning and everyone who didn't win this week can hop on our Facebook page and sign up for the Country Shore giveaway. And while you're on our Facebook page, go ahead and answer our question of the week, which what was the question of the week last week, Cody? Uh, that's a good question. It was a good question. I, that's my I question have, of the day for the question of the week. The, the, the question of the week this week is phenomenal. Although in my brain, I, I skipped, uh, what last week's was I had this week's brought up this week is just a, you're going to be, you're in for it. It's a good one. All right. Um, the, but last week's, should a person have a right to be forgotten on the internet? Yeah, I'm always ahead. I'm always like, that's what we did two weeks ago. I'm always like one behind. And we're like at a 50-50, almost a 50-50 split on this one, um, which is interesting yeah. because I feel like that's an actual accurate reflection of how this kind of breaks down where we have, because it's, it's, it's not would it be nice to be able to be forgotten right. on the internet? It's should you have the right to be forgotten on the inter internet? It'd be interesting so, to see a demographic split there too, because I think there's a huge divide between the older internet audience and the younger internet audience as far as privacy and right to be forgotten and all that stuff goes. Yeah, the old people really want to be forgotten. <laughs> Which don't worry, old people. <laughs> So and then the young people don't want to be forgotten because they love the notoriety of being remembered. I guess that's true. Maybe there should be a right to be remembered. <laughs> a begging to be remembered. <laughs> I guess that's what the internet is. <laughs> that's right. It's pretty much the it's pretty much what it is, the begging to be remembered. All right, so what's this awesome question for next week? Uh, the awesome question for this week is what's one task that doesn't cost any money that you never want to do ever again? Oh my gosh. Like, so like a, like a menial day-to-day, -day, like, like just annoy, annoyance that you have to put up with that you would love yeah, to say, not have to deal with ever again. Say like do the laundry or take out the trash. Gosh. You, you just have to pick one? This is an open-ended question? Yeah, there's, there was It's no, a fill-in-the-blank? The fill-in-the-blank. That's exactly right. Oh, my gosh. I got to think about that one. That's a great question, though. I'm curious to see what people come up with. And it'll be interesting to see what people come up with too, as far as how automatable what they come up with is. So uh, doing the laundry, maybe there's some device that people could come up with or some service. I guess it probably already is, right? There must be some sort of startup laundry service. If not, like throw $70 million at anyone who comes up with that idea. I, seriously. I mean, I would, I would love to never take out the trash again, ever, ever, ever. Take out the trash to the can or take the can to the curb? Mm. the can of the curb is the annoying part and then yes. picking it up and you always forget to pick it up and it's out there for like an entire day and you feel like a bad neighbor well see that that one's not so bad the uh what what i don't like is that the trash can is behind a lock gate so i have to oh it's, yeah that's yeah, terrible it's so annoying it's so annoying well anyways hop on our facebook page and answer that question of the week uh and i'm really curious to see what folks come up with that that's a that's a winner that's a humdinger that is so let's dive right in. Speaking of humdingers, we had a humdinger of an application device that we built, actually. Uh, this would have been 18 months ago. Is that about right? Man, it seems like a lot longer ago than that, but it... it I, I don't know how time works anymore. 18 months ago feels like 18 years ago. 
But anyways, the application and slash device was called Drop Mic. So I guess just give people a, a broad overview of what Drop Mic is and what it accomplished. So Drop Mic was this, it was actually prototyped on a number of boards on a number of microcontrollers and, and uh, microcomputers. Uh, we tried it on a Raspberry Pi, uh, an Arduino, and a BeagleBone. And basically what it was, was a, um, a embedded device, such as one of the ones I mentioned, that was running a uh, Node.js script, which analyzed sound levels uh, on a continuous basis. Uh, it was all packaged up into a, a pretty big box. I'd say the box was probably about this big. Um, and the box was custom fabricated and it had a, for lack of a better term, a, uh, sort of street light pole attached to it that had red or it's all, it's red, yellow, green, right? Green's at top. Was it going the other way? I, I, I don't remember now. Uh, I think it may, no, I think it's right. Green and then yellow and then red. Okay. I think that's exactly right. And, um, so basically the, the embedded computer device was the brains of this box and the box was actually powered off of solar power. So you could put it pretty much every, anywhere and it was meant to be mounted on a telephone pole. Anyway, uh, it sat in, in and also there was a microphone that, that dropped down out of the box. So it had like a hole in the bottom of the box and the, the microphone sat down there. It had a so drop mic? It had a dropped mic. And so from there, the um, <clears throat> the, uh, the 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 microphone would pick up the sound and it would send it to the uh, embedded device, which was running a Node.js script, which was analyzing the sound, uh, basically calculating a, a decibel level and seeing if that decibel level fell within city ordinance city ordinances for that time of day. For example, if it's eleven o'clock, if it's after eleven p.m. Uh, venues ha can, can't go over a certain decibel um, that's different from say if it's five o'clock and so basically it sat there and it recorded sound levels and if it was approaching that threshold that light would go from green to yellow and then if it went over that threshold it would go to red so this would be to let the venue know that they're over sound ordinance and they're going to start getting fined at the same time when it went over to red uh, we sent that information to a control center where uh, city ordinances, city officials could monitor and see and have a record of the sound levels exceeding um, uh, the stated legal limit. And before we dive into the app or the device itself, which was awesome, it was one of the best things you ever built. But uh, let's, I guess, take this opportunity to talk about microcontrollers and IoT and, and sort of the how easy it is to sort of create new gadgets now. So uh, you, you touched on Raspberry Pi and Arduino. Just talk about microcontrollers a little bit and sort of their extensibility and also um, the ability to program on them in a variety of different languages. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a fine point here where there's a difference between microcontrollers and microcomputers. So a Raspberry Pi, for example, is... Uh, a microcomputer has everything that you would need to run a uh, a full fledged computer. It has uh, peripheral connections, um, uh, external storage, um, Wi Fi, all kinds of stuff like that. And so then you have like an Arduino, which Arduino does make uh, microcomputers, but they're yep. more in the microcontroller space where it does like one thing. It's a chip that you plug other stuff into. Uh, you know. Um, you, like you can plug a Raspberry Pi into an Arduino. And so <clears throat> the thing about microcontrollers is they're uh, a lot harder to program for. Not harder, but they're more uh, kind of sensitive. And so to, you know, memory usage and things like that, because they don't have, uh, you know, all the dedicated uh, things that a microcomputer does. Right. And so you have to be sensitive to that uh, when, picking between the two and kind of what you want to do. Um, and so, yeah, it's become so much easier to number one, uh, program for each, each type of those devices, because, um, the, 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 uh, the, hold on one second. What is, someone's knocking at the, my office door. Is that your dog's tail? Shut up. 
I'm looking up now with the uh, as Cody freaks out as his dog. Uh, the programming languages you can use on Raspberry Pi because I know you can do you can do Node, you can do C. Uh, sorry, that was uh, someone was trying to deliver something to the front door. So that's all right. I, I'm looking at the uh, no for an answer. I'm looking at the languages you can actually use in Raspberry Pi now. Oh yeah, well you can use just about anything. Just in, about in anything. Pi, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, except for like, uh, I guess, I think you can even run a, a version of Windows, which would allow you to run uh, .NET technology. But I've never actually seen that done. I'm not sure. <laughs> that would be kind of weird. That would be incredible. Um, but yeah, so and on a microcontroller, that's where your options get limited, and you can run like a, a special flavor of like Node.js, like an embedded flavor of Node.js. Um, or, or typically what will happen is you can actually run remote commands on an Arduino device. And so basically what are becoming really popular are these sensors. And there's basically a sensor for everything. And you basically connect the sensor to a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or whatever. And these sensors send just tons of data. And this is where actually you get into the whole big data space yeah. where um, like you think about big data and you're like, okay, you think about like historical data, like stock prices over the last a hundred years, which that would fall under the category of big data. Sure. But these sensors send as much data uh, as the stocks in a hundred years. They send, they send that much data in like an hour. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the extensibility is the incredible part. And, and I guess the, the range of sensors that are available now, it's everything from like temperature to, it, anything about the the current environment, uh, humidity, like pressure, it can uh, measure like soil uh, moisture contents. I've seen people build stuff where it like automatically waters plants when the soil's moisture content gets too low. Like basically, there's sensors for all this stuff now, and you can create uh, devices that that do basically anything. And like you said, deliver insane amounts of data. So like we, we were talking about uh, building a device that would uh, measure, uh, take temperature readings at hospices or hospitals or basically anywhere where it's sort of critical that the temperature doesn't rise above a certain point. Because I think this was right after the big hurricane that came through and a couple of places lost power. And I think a couple of people died just because it got so hot in the, um, in the hospice. So like, there's just sort of a an unbelievable array of applications for these for these devices. Yeah, and actually, uh, one thing that we've been talking about here is like we have that. I, I sent you the article, a couple articles about it: the red tide and the blue algae. Yep, well, exactly. That's yeah. causing respiratory problems, and so I was thinking that if you could somehow, and I got to look in to see if if there is a kind of uh, bridge for sensors and. Um, say an iOS, so you can plug in sensors to an iOS device. But uh, if you had, if everyone around here had like a sensor attached to the back of their phone that was that was feeding data to an application on the phone, um, you could see if the respiratory levels were dangerous almost immediately. Um, and right now they have to like send it off for testing. Someone has, someone has to report like, hey, I I'm coughing a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so then they are, okay, We've had a lot of reports of people coughing, so we'll go take a sample of the water or the air, send it off, and come back, and we'll say if the, if the if the levels are too high or not. Well, you could have that instantly, and you could have that much more localized if everyone had like a sensor on their back of their phone that was reading that data and could send it, um, you know, send, could broadcast out the levels in real time. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of thing you can accomplish now with IoT, and the uh, I guess to get back to drop mic because we didn't have phones attached to our device, obviously, but uh, you can actually uh, uh, connect to a network through, uh, I guess uh, this was a, it ended up being a Raspberry Pi device, right? Uh, it actually, or was it Arduino? We deployed it as, as BeagleBone, actually. BeagleBone? Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, BeagleBone. Um, so, so you can, you know, you can, uh, with all the various input output ports, you can uh, hook up a network card and basically have remote devices all over the place. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's where like, that's actually the real power of IOT. I mean, uh, you see these hobbyists, they build stuff that is very much available at a um, kind of commercial grade level, like, 
like motion sensors, for example, that'll like allow, that'll alert you when someone walks in your house. Well, that's been done over and over and over again, but it's these environmental sensors and kind of like the ability to equip people to collect data in the wild at a, at a enormous clip. I think that's the true power of IOT. I mean, you see people like uh, they'll have like fuel consumption um, that'll read data off a truck and, and, and send information about fuel consumption. That's all, that's all great. I think it's really cool. Um, but I think that space is actually closing. Um, but this whole uh, sensors in the wild is, is just untold and, and an untapped space where it's kind of like you can pretty much kind of have an open green field for innovating there. Talk about the um, the application itself that this device is hitting, because I think this is one of our first forays into sort of a production scale serverless environment. Yeah, it was, and it was um, it was interesting because again, think about this: we're we were collecting sound sample sound samples every second, pretty much. So um, if you think about that, where the um, <clears throat> we had a few deployments, but imagine if you were deployed at a massive scale. And one thing that was just surprising to us is the cost. And it wasn't actually related to the development or the hosting. It was the bandwidth. Um, we were sending so much data um, over, over um, you know, a, a basically a data plan because we couldn't rely on having Wi-Fi wherever we were um, that we were getting crushed in terms of cost on bandwidth. And since then, um, uh, there's been other companies that have come out that have ha that are starting to roll out special data plans for IoT that makes it cheaper, mm -hmm. uh, but that wasn't available. So you think about like how much data you are sending over, like that, that's like sending, it, it's like sending a really long text message every every second. Every second, right? Was yeah, that was exactly. that on a two G network? Yeah, it was on a two G network, and but then um, the provider started shutting down their two G network. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it, it, it was a big cost issue. Um, and fortunately, um, now that we've kind of um, turned it over, it's not it's not our problem. Um, and there are solutions in the works, but there hasn't been there isn't great solutions out there. It, it, it can get really. And, and if you're like an, if you're like a gigantic company, if you're a gigantic, gigantic company, you can buy a crazy bucket of data um, and just sort of like and it be unlimited, truly unlimited. But you can't do that um, for uh, as a small company. You can't be like, "Hey, I want unlimited data for this IoT device or a hundred IoT devices." It, you just get kind of you basically get like it, it ends up being like a hundred dollars a month per device. Which um, and then as if you don't go over your data cap, which you almost certainly will. So um, when you're talking about prototyping, um, it gets expensive really quickly. Shout out to our new subscriber, Michael Young, by the way. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Um, I, do you think it would make sense for Amazon to roll out something with their push for IoT? And I mean, it would increase usage of uh, the AWS platform itself. Like, should, shouldn't they offer some sort of cheap bandwidth? I mean, they must be able to do that at scale. Yeah, I, I would think that that's an obvious answer. Um, and I, I guess what form that data comes in, I guess, See, I, I'm too ignorant of how the that industry works. Whether they would buy, because like, so for example, um, Metro PC, they have data plans, but they're just basically going off of Verizon's uh, tower. Yeah, that's a lot of these guys sort of just piggyback on the big right. three or four. I guess it's three now, right? Didn't Sprint and T-Mobile merge? Did they merge? Is it is it T-Sprint? Is it Sprint Mobile now? <laughs> <laughs> is it Sprint Mobile? Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the, and that's really in, in the U.S. Anyway, that's it. Um, no one else owns towers other than those guys. So I don't know if Amazon would lease space on those towers or whatever, um, or if they would go a totally different route and have like I don't know, like satellite data. Yeah, um, just build it out. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if they figured out if they figured out a cheap cheap data solution for big data as sort of like one of the if not the leading uh, hosting provider for big data applications, it seems like they would make back their money and more just from the usage of their services. I would think so. I, I, I would think so for sure. And they're the obvious. They're an obvious contender there. Uh, you know, yeah. Google. Google for sure. Yeah. 
Google was going pretty strong with their fiber, with their fiber, but then that kind of slowed down for what reason I have no idea. Um, and so th that would be a big boon for one of these comp one of these big companies is to get uh, a situation where you have cheap IoT data available. Get Jeff Bezos on the horn. That's right. Uh, we had a question here. Uh, can you recommend any good resources for getting started with IoT? Um, yeah, there's a book that, that I read called JavaScript on things. That's a good way to get started. Uh, and then Amazon, if you just, uh, if you just Google AWS IOT, they have a great getting started guide. Uh, and it's, it's just called AWS IOT and they have a, a lot of learning, uh, learning guides specifically for use on AWS, of course, but uh, that's a great way to get started as well. And I mean, then, the cool thing is that, that it's really, it's uh, so cheap to get started. Like the devices so, themselves are cheap so and cheap. the actual, uh, the actual hosting is like, it's pennies. Yeah, it's, it's so cheap. So yeah, I mean, the thing is, I would just say, especially if you have an idea, and I would start with a Raspberry Pi, that seems to be the most friendly uh, in terms of environment, uh, get yourself a Raspberry Pi and figure out how to kind of do what you want to do with that with that thing. And the resources are kind of endless. Um, so I mean, from if you want to hook up a sensor, for example, just just Google uh, connecting sensor to Raspberry Pi. And there are so many resources out there. It's a big hobby community right now. Yeah, it's a huge, huge community out there. Um, any any concluding thoughts on drop mic or any concluding thoughts on our 10 part case study series? Um, you know, like I said, I think that 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 aside from the storage factor, um, because when you're talking about the type of data we were doing, the type of big data we we're doing, it's called time series data. And going back and analyzing and querying time series data is is difficult. Um, and and AWS offers a number of tools to make that easier with uh, Kinesis and and streams and um, Athena and I could go on and on and on EMR. Uh, there's there's so many tools that make it easier, um, but you, you kind of have to understand that uh, big data is one area where your costs are gonna grow quickly. So um, if you're gonna go with AWS, they have offers a free tier for people who are getting started on AWS. And that lasts, I think, a year. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of the big data types, big data centric type uh, platforms on AWS don't have a free tier. Uh, but you can actually just write them and say, Hey, I'm getting started with, uh, I have this idea for a prototype. Uh, I really don't have any funding. Um, can you help me out in the first three months that I try to test this out? And they will give you, uh, credits toward, um, uh, toward, toward, toward like a big data type application. Yeah. And I guess just don't be afraid to dive in. Yeah. yeah. Like all, all this stuff, just get in there and mess around. It's the best way to learn about it. Uh, so I think that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Gunner Technology live stream. Make sure to tune in next Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern time for the next episode. Uh, you can check out the blog post for this episode at GunnerTech.com at our slick new website. Oh, uh, check, out, check, out the, website. check out the podcast. Uh, yeah, the website looks amazing. Check out the podcast on iTunes. Uh, you can hop on over to Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Barnes & Noble, or anywhere else ebooks are sold to check out our series of uh, ebooks. And the ebook for the 10-part uh, case study series should be out within the next couple weeks. Keep an eye out for that too. Hop on our Facebook page to enter the Country Shore giveaway. Country Shore is a lifestyle brand for anyone who loves the outdoors. Visit them at countryshoreoutfitters.com. And while you're on our Facebook page, answer our incredible question of the week <laughs> for next week, which remind them, Cody, what that is. Which is if you could not, if you, if you, if there's one thing you didn't have to do again, that didn't involve money. So yeah, you still have to pay your bills. But uh, that didn't involve money that you never had to do again, what would it be? So hop on our Facebook page, answer that question, and tune in next week at 1 p.m. Eastern time for the next episode of the Gunner Technology live stream and our next 10-part series. We're sort of still determining what that's going to be. Uh, but catch us next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'm Derry. That's Cody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>